Next up, they took my mic away. Slightly worried it was someone from the Department for Education day. Um, next up, by popular demand, for the third year in a row, we have our final keynote speaker of the day. It is the Chief Inspector, Amanda Spielman.
but we're able to test all schools against the same benchmark. So it's certainly something that we continue to discuss with government. So at one level, inspection itself, I think we have continued to be a force for improvement. But false statistics are just one way of demonstrating progress. There are other ways that we make a positive impact. Our research plays a couple of critical roles for us. First, it allows us to add real value across education and social care. We are a children's social care inspector as well as an education inspector. Cross-cutting research allows us to combine what we learn through inspection with new insight and fresh thinking. For example, this year, we published our own research into knife crime in the context of London schools. The timing couldn't have been more tragically apposite. There have been over 30 fatal stabbings in London alone this year, and quite a number of the victims have been of school age. As the media covered three horrific cases, from the gang related to the seemingly random. There's been demand, understandably, from public and politicians for something meaningful to be done. And in among many sensible suggestions, a worrying narrative started to emerge around exclusions. Because it's the sad truth that there are children in schools, particularly some of those living difficult or chaotic lives, who are involved with gangs in their neighbourhoods, when these children are excluded, they take these gang connections with them into the next stage of their schooling. But it started to become common currency that excluded children returning to or being turned onto a gang lifestyle only after they were excluded. As is often the case, this became caught up in the desire for a simple solution, a soundbite solution, that there should be no more exclusions that we should turn off the tap for gang recruiters, no longer send children to people referral units where they can be preyed on by drug dealers and gang leaders. Except that doesn't tally with what we can see. Many crews are doing great work in very difficult circumstances. In some cases, they are turning young lives around and preparing young people, not for a life of crime, but for a new chance to contribute and to thrive. And it's far better to be educated and approved that's registered and inspected than to end up in some of the poor examples of unregistered alternative provision that we highlighted earlier this year. <coughs> many of these offer little in terms of education or support. Many have serious health and safety issues. And we also estimate that as many as 6,000 children may be out of sight in unregistered or illegal schools. Pupil referral units really are a better bet for the children who might otherwise slip through the net of education. But I'm a realist, and we know that life chances for young people who are excluded are often limited compared to those who remain in school. Exclusion should be a last resort, though it must be available to head teachers in extremists. Nobody should ever be a cheerleader for exclusion, but sometimes it's the only way to manage persistently unacceptable behaviour that threatens the education or the safety of classmates. It must rain on the table. Our knife crime research found no clear causal link between exclusion and knife crime. So we spoke out against the neat sound bites and we pressed local authorities, the police and other partners to include schools more readily in their existing partnerships to tackle knife crime and other kinds of serious youth violence. It wasn't radical thinking and it wasn't a silver bullet, but it was based on our research and evidence. A second role that our research plays is the gathering of intelligence and insight to underpin the development of our inspection model. The curriculum research that we carried out ahead of crafting the new inspection framework was crucial. It underlined why we were right to concentrate on the curriculum in our thinking. We saw that even in some very good schools, which were scoring well at inspection, something was getting lost. We saw that years of overemphasis on exam performance by a number of agencies, including Ofsted, were having a corrosive effect in some classrooms. This focus on performance had the unintended and unwanted effect.
effect of curricula being narrowed across the age groups. So in Key Stage 2, we saw the depressing impact of teaching to the test. Primary schools spending a disproportionate amount of time on maths and English, to the detriment of science and, indeed, other humanities, the arts, practical subjects, often lumped together into some rather nebulous topic work. It's not good preparation for life in Year 7, when children should be ready to enjoy a wider menu and have opportunities to tackle new challenges and wrestle with new ideas. And all that for the SATs, which are fundamentally for the benefit of the school. I have nothing against SATs per se, as tests, they serve a purpose. But as I've said before, it's wrong and unnecessary to ratchet up the pressure on young children as they approach them, where they ought to barely register that they're being tested. And it's certainly a great waste of children's last years at primary school if their curriculum experience is mostly limited to two subjects. So the first challenge for us was to recognise the part that we played in creating this unwanted culture and to see what could be done to put the curriculum back at the heart of education. And the second challenge was to do that without undermining or reversing the very many improvements that we've seen over recent years. We really wanted to bring about a positive change, but carefully and responsibly, and I hope that we've succeeded. Which brings me on to the curriculum and the changes we're making to the inspection framework. Now, I've spoken about this many times in recent months and about what it means, so I don't want to talk about the nuts and bolts here. Um, for those of you who are thirsty for detail, um, my colleagues Sean Harford, Matthew Purvis, Paul Joyce will be talking about it here tomorrow afternoon, so please do go along. But this is a good moment to stop and thank everyone individuals and organised organisations who've helped develop this new inspection model. Many thousands of people have contributed to a process that really has drawn on the full spectrum of expertise and insight from every quarter and really has made this framework strong and valuable to parents and to schools and of course to all other kinds of education provider alike. For myself, and all my colleagues, I can say that this really has been an enriching experience. But this afternoon, I'd rather reflect on the shift that's happened since we started to talk about the curriculum. Three years ago, education discussions tended to linger not on what was taught, but on how it was taught. Just debates on pedagogy raged, and for many, where you stood on the traditionalist progressive debate to find your character forevermore. Now though, curriculum is a hot topic. There are any number of sessions here in this festival discussing what is a good curriculum. And that reflects many discussions going on across education publications, online, as well as in schools. And rather than seeing the curriculum focus as a challenge, it does seem that leaders and teachers alike seem energised by the opportunity to think harder about what they teach as well as how they teach it. And I see that as an example of the soft power that Ofsted undoubtedly wields. Inspection is often seen, wrongly in my view, as something of a big stick. But incorrect or no, the perception that you carry a big stick, as Roosevelt observed, does mean that people will listen to you. Above everything else that we've achieved in recent years, prompting a resurgence of interest in a strong curriculum and a rigorous debate about what children should learn has been the most satisfying. And I hope it will have a lasting impact on the lives of the children who are currently passing through school. I also talked about British values in my 2017 speech about the importance of embedding them in the wider curriculum. And I spoke about the need for a true civic education. Both of these remain just as true today. It is so important that all these values are taught and understood and lived. None of them is an easy concept for young people to grasp. And none of them is as universally recognised as we might like to think. They don't just rub off on children without ever being taught. School is 
how and where we make sure that every young British citizen ends up with the same level of understanding. I'm not going to put you on the spot and ask you to tell me the four British values that are particularly referenced by DFB. Instead, I'll remind you that they're democracy, the rule of law, individual liberty, and mutual respect and tolerance of those with different faiths and beliefs. And they are each being tested by a combination of events and social changes. I'm not one of the voices claiming that democracy is under some sort of existential threat, but it's true that it's not in rude health at present. The rule of law does remain a clear bedrock of society, the society at large, but equality's law is clearly coming under strain, especially where some of the different rights that we value and protect are bumping into each other. I've spoken recently about the protests at some primary schools over the teaching of relationships education that includes some recognition of same-sex relationships. I have been very clear that the laws of the land don't allow us to pick and choose which protected characteristic under the Equality Act we actually want to protect. We are a highly diverse country. We place equal legal value on the rights of women, on equality of opportunity for people with disabilities, and on respect for people of different races, religions, and sexual orientation. There is no hierarchy in the legislation. But with so many deeply entrenched positions, there can be a tendency for cause wars, as in all characteristics may be equal, but my characteristic is more equal than yours. Different groups often view the, tolerance, the concept of tolerance and respect through their own particular lens. And within schools, we're starting to see how damaging it can be to have this kind of self-determination of what acceptable, tolerant, and respectful looks like. It thwarts the attempts to reach the kind of consensus between schools and parents that is so important. More generally, in education, we often talk about preparing young people for life in modern Britain. We certainly use the phrase a good deal at Ofsted. It runs through a lot of what we're about as an organisation because it neatly encapsulates one of the important roles of education. Because education is about a lot of things. It's about the acquisition of knowledge for its own sake. It's about the broadening of horizons through that knowledge. It's about the development of the skills that are needed to make a success of adult life. It's about socialisation, encouraging harmony between different people. And it's about the advancement of civilization. Education pioneers across the world knew this as they began to formalise state education systems. The founders of the Common School Movement in the United States wanted to more fine, upstanding citizens of the public as much as they wanted to instil knowledge and a habit of reading and learning, preparing children for life in 19th century America, if you will. Recent conversations with our Ofsted counterparts from France, Sweden and the Netherlands have showed us how the same debates are echoed in other countries. So it's important to have this kind of wider thinking in mind when considering what preparing young people for life in modern Britain really means. The phrase is often used about the role of schools in instilling children with respect for people who may be different from them. That is certainly part of the aim, but it would be wrong to narrow the work down to a discussion about inequalities, or even about wider British values. We need to consider the influences and interactions that Britain and the wider world bring to bear on a modern child. The range of influences on children has changed out of all recognition in the last couple of generations. Children's consumption of information is very different, and the context provided by the world around them is different too. Starting with the last point, in recent years, we've watched the fragmentation of the traditional political tribes, not just here, but across the world. We've seen the rise of single issue campaigns and campaigners. But looking at the world through a single lens can lead us to lose sight of the bigger picture. Complexity is shunned, and political discourse narrows and becomes more polarised. Simplicity is not of itself a bad thing. 
simple narratives are the gold standard in politics. They help connect otherwise disengaged voters with the complicated world of statecraft. They achieve cut through. And there are some parallels here. I think the teaching, making the complex understandable and bringing dry facts to life. But what we increasingly see is not a simple narrative, but a simplistic one that isn't good for anyone. A narrative in which the world's problems have a single neat solution, where scapegoats abound and critics are seen as the enemy, to be discredited or discounted or disowned. There's an anti-education narrative in this as well. Elites can't be trusted. The educated may have learned a lot in ivory towers and among dreaming spas, but they'll never understand the real world. Narrowing and polarising is happening on many fronts. We're seeing universities coming under pressure to withdraw invitations to speakers that the student body decides it can't abide. And pressure groups are not always political in the traditional sense. I know of at least two recent instances where schools have faced fierce protests from animal rights and vegan protesters for raising animals on school grounds and encouraging the children to learn about and be involved in their care. The objectors were outraged because these animals were in time to be slaughtered to provide meat for the school canteen. It's relatively easy in the modern world to build a considerable head of steam from a single issue campaign. The ubiquity of social media makes a few clicks to sign up to the latest cause, add your name to a rapidly growing petition, or spread the word about the next protest march. In education, there are often sophisticated campaigns that seek to add topics to the curriculum and quickly gather support. The media is awash with stories inspired by these campaigns, and the list of things that schools really must cover grows ever longer. Sleep lessons, farming, first aid, online relationships, sign language, gardening, among the list of suggestions in recent months. And that's um, avoiding some of the ones that would bring a blush to my cheek and probably yours to talk about. <laughs> I'm certainly not saying that these ideas lack merit, but they highlight a wider point about the role of schools. And it's something that we've raised concerns about. Because for every responsibility that gets loaded onto schools, something has to give. Curriculum planning is a challenging job, and we're encouraging schools to strike the right balance between subjects. Adding the latest hot topic results in a trade-off Something that might have more merit for young people may be getting squeezed out. Schools have a finite amount of time to educate, and so what we demand of them must be manageable. We had calls from quite a number of campaign groups to put additional checks of various kinds into the inspection framework. Again, many of them sounded perfectly reasonable until we stopped to think about the practicalities and the kinds of specialist expertise that would be required to do them justice. Not to mention what a long list of new checks would do to the time it takes to carry out an inspection. And we are already actually accustomed to balancing many expectations within inspection that we don't come under as much pressure as some 